Welcome to the shooting show. This week we're all about thermal imaging and night vision in pursuit of the fox. Plus Nigel Allen looks at an interesting air pistol from Walther. That's just as much fun as the real deal. Byron's out foxing on the west coast and he's got an armful of goodies to take with him including the new Photon night vision from Yukon and Pulsar Thermal Imager. After getting foxing pal Aidan Anand up to speed with the gear in the daylight it's off to a commercial pheasant shoot to put them to good use. A fox is often money lost here so effective fox control is vital. <laughs> Eden and pheasant keeper Ben Cowie head off to get a good vantage point as the afternoon draws to a close and discuss the plan. What's the plan here Ben? You're expecting to see some foxes here? Yeah, yeah hopefully. Hopefully pumping uh, a few cobs. We saw one just up in the, the field in front of us. Uh, but unfortunately it took off after getting chased by these cows. Um, hopefully bump into them again. As the pair wait for signs of life, Ben takes us through his foxing setup. You've moved over to night vision yeah. quite recently. How yeah. has it changed how you hunt? Um, it's changed, if you lamping wise, it's changed a lot because you're, as soon as you see something, you're turning off the lamp and it's complete darkness. So I suppose you're hoping, you're hoping for it just to carry on its business. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously then that you're causing less less uh, disturbance if you know what I mean. Do uh, so you find that the foxes tend to just go about their business? Yeah, what what I found anyway, I've never really had one that's wanted to get away from you. Um, and what unit do you use? I use the Pulsar NA750 mm -hmm. with the infrared uh, Nightmaster mm -hmm. 800. Uh, which I find is a, a great setup. It's a big improvement having yeah. the 800 on as opposed to the big, built-in Big hour. improvement, yeah. a, a lot clearer. And in terms of um, range, yeah. what, what's the capability of a unit like that? Um, I would be comfortable every time at 200 mm -hmm. with this rifle. It would maybe vary on a, a smaller calibre rifle, but with a 2 2 250 I'd be happy at 200 every time, mm -hmm. uh, but I would I would take a shot at 300. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing what a different. You wouldn't be able to do that without the night master, though, would you? No chance. Not a ch no. If you were going to, if I was recommending it, I would make sure that you get the night master as well. Mm -hmm. A nearby herd of cows is unlikely to be improving their chances at Charlie, so with light starting to fade on this afternoon session, they decide to move on. Ben knows the land well, and having been out after foxes over previous nights, he takes Eden round to a position where he spied fox and badger activity before. Almost immediately, Eden is able to pick up something through the thermal imager. What have you seen, Eden? Uh, there's a very small speck just over the, the brow there, so it's worth having a look at. We need to get a bit closer because it's not even picking up in the binos very well. So it's worth worth having a walk. We've seen a lot of badgers, but it's not a badger. Mm, it's not a badger. Confident the thermal imager is showing them a fox, they decide to head further down and try to squeak it in. I think it's probably come down to the corner. I think. Yeah, it will take a while. Even if we get in the direct in the area, we can uh, hopefully squeak it in. They spy a roe deer at the bottom of the hill, but unfortunately they lose track of the fox. You see a gap between the hedgerow and the dike. I think it's a dead tree and there's a sugar one. I think the roe deer's in between there and the I think there's a heat signature. Probably closer to the hedgerow than the Yeah, I think you're right to see the hedgerow.
can't see any sign of it. Yeah. Um, I'll push on a bit and then uh, have a look again. But the trail hasn't gone completely cold, and Ben spots the fox walking back towards them. Eden readies himself behind the rifle. We were walking that direction because we saw something on the thermal and uh, we got closer to that we couldn't make out what it was and all of a sudden we heard a bunch of crows going off behind us. Byron turned around with the binos, saw something, I looked up at the thermal, saw it as well. It was making its way down the field and then we got to this rise, got down on the deck keep walking towards us, even though the wind is going that way slightly. Uh, he followed the fence, just about came up to the gate, paused, uh, put him down. Do you think you were going to lose him for a minute? I did lose him for a minute, and because uh, uh, last time I followed him, he was further out in the field, and I picked him up again when he was closer to the fence. But, uh, yeah, he paused, paused at the wrong time. The boys make their way down the hill towards a fallen fox to inspect the kill shot. How was he sitting when you took the shot, Eden? Square on. Look at me. Ben, how many um, cubs have you shot this year so far? This year, we've shot oh, about five, but uh, mainly we picked them up and snaring. Mm -hmm. uh, we snare quite a lot. Uh, but so this will be number six then? Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> number six. Hopefully, one or two more tonight. With success in the day, attention turns towards the night, and Eden and Ben are joined by Saul Patterson, owner of the Moot Hill Shoot. It's time to put the Pulsar and Yukon through their paces and Sol is a very interested party, having not used thermal or digital night vision equipment before. Sol is able to spot plenty of heat signals through the imager and quickly hones in on a fox. They attempt to squeak the fox into Eden's range, tracking it across the field. As Eden takes the shot, the fox is hit, but adrenaline aids its tenacity and the fox gets up to gain a few yards. However, it's technically dead on its feet and despite readying himself, Eden doesn't have to take a follow-up shot. Oh, I reckon it's going to be 1.53. Eden? One thirty. Ben, put us out of misery. One fifty. One fifty. <sighs> Makes finding your dead fox is quite easy, doesn't oh, it, Ben? Very yeah. easy. The thermal imager clearly shows the heat signatures of the two hunters and the recently deceased fox. Which way around was he standing? He was, stand he was running this direction. He must have been standing like this to me. So I've nailed him. I don't know how he ran so far. 
It happens with the 223 sometimes. Though. Well, yeah, you said it before. Oh, the 223 you're shooting? Yeah. Oh, right. I thought, I thought it was a 243. That's what I thought. Well, that, no. was, the, that, was, that the, was the rifle earlier. The day scope. Ben, if that was a 250, would have that happened? No chance. No chance. No chance. Would have done the more trouble too. <laughs> we made the fence and beyond. Talk me through seeing it and what your sight picture was and all of that because it's, it's a new bit of night vision kit. Yeah, well, we came came around the corner, spotted it in the field, and uh, got suited and booted. Um, uh, as soon as I picked it up uh, in the sight, like I could definitely identify it as a fox. So yeah, tracked it down, it stopped, bang, and managed to follow it even perfectly with uh, when it ran. So yeah, it's a good bit of kit anyway. But, well. Even even though it's a complete scope, like I'm quite comfortable with shooting it. So you've been kind enough to let us come and test some equipment, some thermal and some night vision out for foxes. But tell me a little bit about the ground that we've been shooting over and what you do. Uh, basically, we uh, we run a commercial shoot here, um, and obviously the foxes are a big big issue due to nesting birds and obviously pheasants, poults and partridges jugging on the ground. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but all the widened species like oyster catchers and the curlews and such like, we like to try and keep on top of them for conservation and work so morning. How many, how many days a year are you, you putting them uh, We roughly do between 30 and 40 days. They range from, you know, 50 bird days up to whatever you want to do really, 400, 600, whatever. Mm. Uh, we cater for all parties, um, and whatever standard people want to shoot to, you know, low, high, whatever. We've got the we've got the ground. Very lucky we've got the ground of, you know, deep gorges and valleys, and um, we can show some nice birds. Um, you had a, a chance to play with the thermal imaging a bit tonight. Yeah. What is your impression of it? Very impressed, to be honest with you. It's the sort of bit of kit I should be definitely looking f looking into the future to make buying. For the sort of money for what I do, it's worth the money. For, a, uh, for someone who's doing it as a profession. professional, yeah. what I like about it, you can just you can actually see things further away than what you can of a lamp, uh, even though you can't quite identify what it is at a distance. But at least you you can creep in slowly towards your target. Eden there, showing all that time bunking off from university rifle shooting was well worth it in the end. And now the shooting show news. This is the Shooting Show News. Marking the start of the grouse season, grouse will be available on the High Street for the first time. Marks and Spencer is to offer grouse as part of its new range of British game, which is set to hit the shelves from October. This comes as new figures estimate the grouse season to be worth £67 million to the economy. That's the equivalent of 42,500 days of work. More news in Modern Gamekeeping magazine. Rural areas have untapped potential to the tune of £350 billion. That's the bottom line of a new DEFRA report. About 28% of British businesses are rural, but they only contribute 19% of total economic output. DEFRA said more government policies to support rural development were needed to address the imbalance. Lack of finance, poor mobile and internet coverage and lack of access to markets were highlighted as areas where the government must do better. The call has gone out for Britain's potential shooting stars at the Commonwealth Games. Ahead of next year's Games in Glasgow, the CPSA has asked its members to submit their best scores from selection events in Olympic Trap, Olympic Skeet and Double Trap. The top competitors will be invited to take part in the Commonwealth Training Group and will bid to repeat the gold medal success Team GB enjoyed at the London Olympic Games. For more, don't miss Clay Shooting Magazine. Baskers asked police forces for formal assurance that they do not give the RSPCA access to firearms licensing information. The Telegraph reported that one in four police forces gave license holders personal information to the RSPCA. But the Association of Chief Police Officers said the RSPCA had no direct access to records and could only make requests for disclosure if it was pursuing a prosecution. Basque and the Countryside Alliance have questioned the legal basis of any such arrangement. And finally, the Countryside Alliance Awards 2013 are open for business. Nominations have opened for the awards, nicknamed the Rural Oscars, and stay open until the 1st of November. You can nominate a local business in the category of local food, village shop or post office, butcher or rural startup. Visit countrysidealliancewards.org.uk for more information. That was the Shooting Show News.
great fun. Now, there are four million air guns in the United Kingdom, and a fair percentage of those are air pistols. This is the Walther CP99, and it comes to the UK via Armex, who are the UK distributor for the world gun making power that is Umarex. Now, the Walther CP99 is very much a doppelganger for the Walther P99, and that, as James Bond aficionados will know, is the gun that he chose over the PPK in the film Tomorrow Never Dies. So, if ever there's a good reason for owning an air pistol, that is it. In the case of this Walther CP99, it all gets rather confusing, because although it's an air pistol, it actually isn't powered by air. In fact, it's powered by CO2 gas, or carbon dioxide, which comes in liquid format, and it vaporises on contact to the atmosphere. Now, it's a very common power system for air pistols, and it's one of the biggest advantages is that it's recoilless. Plus, you get loads of shots per charge. So, in the case of the CP99, you actually enjoy a full semi-auto action. I think plenty of air gunners would want to own a CP99 just because of its looks. But personally, I want to shoot it as well. And to do that, you first got to power it up, or gas it up, as they say. To do that on the Walther, you have to release what would be the stick magazine in the real McCoy. In the case of the air pistol, the grip holds a 12 gram CO2 capsule, fairly standard in air pistol terms. Umarex have made charging up their CP99 very easy. Once you've released the capsule holder from the grip, you simply just have to twist the base, unscrew this little brass knurled screw, and then extract your empty capsule before inserting a new one, neck up. Then you just take up some finger tension on the brass unit before closing it all off, which will power up the system. Then it's just a question of putting it back into the grip. Personally, I like to give it a good old slap, just like the real thing. Because the CP99 is based on the P99, a lot of the features are the same. For instance, the magazine release, which on the CP99 is actually the capsule release, is built into the trigger guard. Either side, you just literally push down with one of your fingers and it will drop out of the grip. In the case of the CP99 air pistol, the magazine is held within the top slide, which is released via a small catch on the left-hand side of the action. Once it's opened, you extract 8-shot rotary magazine. Now this is fairly standard on all of Umarex's air pistols, and it's fairly foolproof. All you have to do is load your pellets into each of the chambers and make sure that they're fully inserted. Then just replace the magazine into the top slide, close it, and you're ready to go with a full payload. I always think that a safety cat is essential when it comes to air pistols, and thankfully the CP99 is a good one. It's actually got a safety within a safety. On the right hand side of the grip frame, you'll see a long bar. That pushes forward to engage the safety catch, which effectively disengages the trigger entirely. The trigger is now inoperable. To reset the safety catch, which effectively engages the trigger, you slide it back. But before you can do that, you have to push in a locking bar before you can slide. Just like the P99, Walther's CP99 comes with a decent set of iron sights. They're not really adjustable, although there is some windage movement on the rear sight if you need it. But they're nice deep square cuts, a fat bladed foresight that lines up with a, a very wide notch on the rear sight. And it's good enough for the ranges that you want to be shooting an air pistol over, six yards, 10 meters at the maximum. You've also got the option to fit a laser sight or maybe even a tactical flashlight, because at the front of the Walther, you've got this accessory rail. It's a 22 millimeter Weaver or Picatinny fit. True to style, the CP99 shares a lot of similarities with its bigger brother. For a start, the grip frame is made of a nice high-tech polymer and the top slide is metal. In fact, there are many metal parts on the air pistol version. You can also, just like the original, change the back strap, and there are two that come in the case. This allows a much better fit in your palm if you need it. There are two ways you can shoot the CP99, one in double action mode, or two in single action mode. In double action mode, pulling the trigger all the way actually indexes the magazine first before firing the shot. But in single action mode, you first have to cock the trigger by pulling the top slide back. That effectively sets the trigger, which allows a much more controlled release of the shot. 
You use double action mode if you want some fast fire fun, single action mode if you're after target shooting and a nice tight group. Air pistols are all about fun. Yes, you can get match pistols that are great for targets, but the CP99 isn't really one of those. To get the most out of this gun, you really want to be shooting reactive targets, like tin cans and bottle tops. Now on a hot day like today, a capsule gives you enough gas for about 80 to 100 shots. Maybe 10 or so less if it's a cold day, but that's the nature of CO2. But it doesn't detract from the wonderful fun you can have. If you've got a couple of spare hours to enjoy plinking away in the back garden, there is no finer way to do it than with the Walther CP99 air pistol. What a cracking little CO2 gun it is. Well that's it for this week, thanks for watching. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.